um, as you all know, we have been prepping for reopening and or reentry, whichever verbiage that you want to use. So we have been, or the regional center along with DDS and CDC and quite a few other folks have kind of created, I'd like to say it like bullet points or what we should be using as far as our plans to send in to our Q&A people or to regional center. Um, so those were sent out. I know most of you have been working on this for a couple weeks now. So that's all wonderful. So this is like a follow up to that. And we have Mary Lou on here that's going to speak to that. Petite is on here because she is like the medical warrior in the field. So she's got a, a, a multitude of great information that she's been working on. And then Rhiannon's going to answer any questions. Tom is on here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to back away. And I think, um, Mary Lou, if you want to start and then we'll go to <coughs> Petite, is that okay? Or did you want Petite to go first? Um, let me just do a little bit of an intro. And then I think Petite will help to provide some guidance to people. Um, you know, if we talked yesterday, I would have said something different from today. It, it's an ever-changing situation. <coughs> Cases are on a really huge um, increase. Um, it's, there's been over 2,000 to 2,500 a day with one day peaking at 4,000 or 4,100. So when we sent out the letter about reopening, we did it because we were responding to service providers saying, hey, we want to start doing in-person services. And we really, want everybody to move forward in this in a mindful way. You know, we really want, I mean, it's really looking at the risk, how to mitigate the risk and how to help the individual understand the risk. So, um, as I said, I'm not sure that, you know, we had probably in June thought the, in, the retention funding or the non-residential payment funding was going to end at the end of July. Not 100% sure anymore. I don't want to say it's going to go or it's not because we don't know. But what we wanted to do is take an opportunity to help you to decide how you want to do services. We don't want to force people to do in-person services, but we also need DDS to help us to develop a rate structure to provide virtual services as well. So um, we did just get correspondence from ARCA, literally 10 minutes before we got on this call, as I said, it's ever changing. I've sent it to Joni, she'll get it out to people, but it's ARCA and um, a provider group, or citizen, develop, citizens with developmental disabilities group, requesting some of the things we've all been asking for over the few, last few months. So we will get that out to you, but I'm gonna let Petit talk about if you're going to start in-person services, some of the things you need to think about. Um, thank you. Um, hi, and I'm sorry that we're going through this, all of us. And as Mary Lou said, it changes, not just daily, but by hour. And we need to be as flexible as possible, which has created a lot of anxiety for me because I think I have something set and then I hear new information. I start my day by reviewing my nursing journal, articles. Um, I was trained in public health in New York. Um, so my concerns are, where am I getting my, my information from? Is it valid information? Um, is it reliable? And I really want to caution everybody on just grabbing information from places that are not related to true public health stats. Um, and medical stats from a known reliable source. When I was trained in public health, and I'm an old lady, we were told it took seven to 21 days to incubate a germ. Somehow it's become a miracle, it's only 14 days. If that's what it is, I have to embrace that because that's what I'm being told by experts. I am not an expert on COVID-19. I, I am pretty good at looking at how to prevent. I don't believe in tertiary care. I don't believe in critical intervention. 
I believe the more you can prevent, the less of tertiary care and critical care you have to exercise. So at LA Gold, I'm knocking on wood. We closed a week before everybody else. We have not had one case. We provide services to over 350 people within our families, caregivers, and our staff and people that receive services. So we've been very lucky. And I, and I credit that with our preventative measures every single day that we offer program services prior to COVID. So I've broken this down. When I started doing my plan, by the way, Mary Lou, I got no guidelines from DDS. I don't know what guidelines you're talking about. I already have my phase one, phase two done. Now I just can't wait to get the guidelines to see what I omitted. But I would appreciate if somebody would send me that. Um, I've broken it down to several areas, environment, entry, and just general. Environmentally, and these are recommendations that maybe you have not thought about, maybe you have, maybe it's redundant. But in the environment, we've already prepared our agency, all 8,000 square feet of it. We removed unnecessary and decorative items. Anything that a droplet could attach to. Um, we assured items that are fixed to the walls or framed. All signs have been laminated to allow for disinfection. I don't know about you. We have visually imp impaired people. They love to get closer, even though things are big, to look at things. Um, so we made sure that everything is disinfect, that we can disinfect. All our doors remain open, every single door that has a handle. This limits the contact by hand. It also helps decrease the necessity for constantly wiping handles. The only door that is not left open are the entry doors to the building. Um, we are, when we open, we will be limiting access to unused rooms that have already been disinfected and that aren't being used for program. This will help all the EDs and all the staff when it comes to dis re-disinfecting every single day at the end of your service. I'm not saying you don't need to disinfect continually, you do. But you have to do a grand disinfection. And I would say, depending on the square foot of the room, you'd wanna assign two staff to it and and maybe do a role play to show exactly what you're gonna do so that everybody has the same information and they're all doing it the same way. Um, your HVAC systems before you open should be evaluated. Your here, heating and air conditioning systems. If you have ducts and you have a maintenance contract, you should check with your maintenance people and see if your ducts are clear and clean. We do ours every year. We, our, our maintenance system is maintained on a six month basis. We've changed our contract to every three months. We requested that we have, um, that they certify that they are using industrial HEPA filters similar to the ones being used in hospitals. So all the filters on our five units are being changed every three months. Our ducts are clean. Um, we, are, we also checked our hot water heater. We wanted to be sure that the hot water was at the temperature recommended for adequate hand washing. We also had a safety valve installed to assure there would be no scalding. We do have a bathroom for toileting accidents. We wanted to be sure the shower would never get hot enough to scald someone. That's something I, I assume most people have already. If not, I would look into that. Um, we will be purchasing and labeling small pedal operated trash cans and they will be labeled 
contaminated waste. I do not want people who have um, increased saliva that creates drooling on their masks. I do not want those masks because we, we're gonna have to change them frequently. I don't want them in regular garbage cans. I want them con considered contaminated waste. Anybody that blows their nose, that is a contaminated waste product. That will go in there. And that will be dealt differently when we tie it up. It'll be done only by staff. We have a custodial team that we hired at LA Gold. They are our participants. That's how they earn their income. And we will be training them on that. They already wear gloves and masks prior to COVID anyway. I really recommend you getting contaminated waste receptacles. You're gonna need them. Um, when it comes to our soft opening and our re-entry process, um, we will, in phase one when, and phase two, we will not allow public transportation. Anybody on public transport will not be coming. They have to be transported by the people that surround them on a daily basis, whether it's their family, members or caregivers. Um, when we get to stage three, we will open it up to access and um, buses and Uber. However, those individuals will have to bring in a change of clothing immediately. When they enter, they will change their clothing and the clothing they wore in will be put in um, sealed bags and then they can take them home. If they don't have the wherewithal to wash their clothing, we, the staff, will assure washing clothing and they can reuse them the next day. Um, when it comes to drop off, of course, it's going to be staggered. The staff will meet the participants in the parking lot. Participants will remain in the car they arrived in. Um, while the participant is in the car, staff will assure that they have a mask on first the staff and the individuals in the car. They will take the participants' temperature while they are still in the car. The staff will, we have a form that we created with 10 questions. It's a short form. It's a yes, check off. It will be our COVID login for re-entry. We will keep it documented and filed. It will be done every single day. There is a section where you can register the temperature for that day. If anybody wants that form, I'd be happy to send it to Mary Lou. You can adapt it. They're very simple questions. Um, and we've really narrowed it down. I'm not asking the question, have you had a COVID test? I am asking the question, is anybody sick in your house? Are you sick? I am asking the question, did, has anybody been tested for COVID in your house? If yes, was it positive? At that point, if they answer any of the questions on our form, um, the staff will be directed to come get me and I will turn the participant away until they go through regular procedure to get clearance to re-enter. Once all that's done, the staff will double check when they get out of the car to walk towards the building that they have a lunch bag. But that lunch bag is not gonna be a regular lunch bag. It's gonna be a brown paper disposable bag or a plastic Ziploc bag. They are not gonna be allowed to bring in thermoses, water bottles, upholstered lunch bags. And we're gonna give direction that all lunches should be made that can be um, not refrigerated. There will be no backpacks, no hats, no extra outer clothing. All that is a vehicle for germs. When they get to the building, there will be a staff that will sign them in on their timesheets. There will be, there will, that staff will also provide hand sanitizer for them to sanitize their hands. They will be directed to the room that they will be receiving program services in and where they will be leaving their lunch bag. Um, they will be told to sit in the seats that have already been prearranged for six foot distancing. Um, 
What else? Let me see. We have a big art studio. We have a big problem, but we're very lucky. We have two sinks in that art studio. So artists will immediately put on a smock, a cleanly laundered smock. They will wear that smock all day long. That is their smock. When their employment is over, they will take their smock off and put it in a large garbage bag. The staff will immediately wash those in our washer and dryer. Um, everything will be disinfected in this building, including every art supply they are assigned. Um, things will be sprayed with Lysol, as you all know. Lysol's got the thumbs up um, from the EPA this week that they're the best thing since sliced bread for COVID. But I also want to give you another option and you could go on the EPA website and um, do a search on everything that you're using to clean your Purell, all that. There's an EPA registration number. You can enter it and it will tell you if this product that you want to use or you want to purchase. And I recommend you really research it before you go out buying all this stuff um, because you may be wasting your money. Um, and it will tell you if it will kill COVID-19. There is something called microban, M-I-C-R-O-B-A-N, products. Not only are they recognized by the EPA, but they also provide a protective layer on non-permeable substances. I'm not talking upholstery. You got upholstery, get rid of it. Start using folding chairs, whatever you can wipe down, because upholstery is death. It's, it just sticks to you and you can't clean it. Um, but microban products are available at Walmart. They are available on the Amazon. They will provide a shield for up to 24 hours that continues to kill bacterial um, exposure. And it's for COVID-19. Am I telling you, use it. And then if somebody sneezes, don't disinfect. I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you, it gives you a secondary preventative measure. If somebody sneezed, you better, you better clean everything. Yeah. Um, when it comes to lunch, everybody will disinfect their hands. We're staggering lunches. They will disinfect their hands. Um, they will leave their masks on. They will carry their own lunch bags to the table. There will be no food sharing. I'm sure you're all aware they love to food share. Um, there will be no food sharing. We provide disposable, um, we always did, it's not environmentally healthy, but it was physically healthy and preventative. Disposable forks, knives, and spoons, disposable napkins, and disposable paper plates. I don't want them putting their food on the table because if they take a bite and they put it on the table, they could be in infecting themselves. So we will provide that, staff will give it out. They are not allowed to seek it for themselves. We have a big cart that provides those supplies, but the staff will hand it to them. When they take their masks off, before they take their masks off, they will be taking their food out of their disposable bag. They will take their masks off. If their masks are still in good condition, they will pl place them in the disposable lunch bag. After lunch, if the mask is in good condition and we don't have to replace it, we will allow them to reuse that mask. All things will be then thrown out, everything will be disinfected, and they'll go on with their day. At our agency, our, our participants answer our phone because we do office training. So we are gonna schedule shifts on the phone the area, the reception area where they answer will be disinfected in between shifts, including the phone and everything around them. Again, there will be minimal things for them to be in contact with. Those are some of the things that I've come up with. I'm sure you've all come up with many, many things too. Um, I just wanna remind you 
You could be tested today and tomorrow you could be positive. You could be asymptomatic and show nothing. People with depressed immune systems, I'm one of them. I have severely depressed immune system. I do not get a fever. I haven't had a temperature in 60 years because I, a temperature is an indicator that your body is, in, is fighting infection. Immune suppressed people don't usually get temperatures. I hope I helped you today. Hey, Petit, um, can, I, can I jump in real quick? Because there's a couple of questions for you. Um, and so people that have been typing in their questions. So there's, there's, a, there's two that kind of stu stood out to me. And Rhiannon, maybe you could jump in here too. Um, people are asking about the masks and what the recommended masks are. And we are getting this constantly every day because the recommendations change. So that's one question. And the second question is, is when you're dealing with toddlers, is there a different mask? Oh God. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you could talk about that for a little bit, that'd be great. Okay, in regards to toddlers with disabilities, you're talking about toddlers with disabilities? Okay. And in regards to people with disabilities who have tactile um, issues, that they don't like things on them, it's extremely difficult. The best thing I can tell you um, is you're going to have to do some adaption. Some, people, some children like the plastic shield because it's not as suffocating to them. Some people with autism like the plastic shields. And we're recommending to our families that have people with autism to please start experimenting with them what they're comfortable with. I, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. So for the younger ones, I've recommended, um, unfortunately, this is a contagion item, but I've recommended sewing buttons to baseball caps and putting the elastic on the baseball cap button so it's not on their ears. Many of the children don't want anything on their ears. They don't like the close proximity. They feel like they're being suffocated. So that, that helps them. What, Tom? Yeah, let me let me just jump in also because I have a I have a five year old daughter who is currently in camp, um, and so I've seen the protocols that that that's happening. I've seen kind of live on the ground um, what she what they have is and the bottom line is that the children these like four and five year old children they do not keep face masks on and no matter what you do um, they have she wears like a it's like a gaiter around her neck that you can pull yeah. up and they have them basically come in with them on she'll wear it you know coming in um and then they primarily keep the activities outdoors because yeah. outdoors, uh, transmission is a lot less um it's just it's just better and it's easier to kind of distance the children and they have small groups they'll do activities primarily outdoors they do a temperature check when they come into the camp yeah. Um, and, but the reality is, and I, you know, it's just, you're not going to keep masks on kids. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Um, and it's one of those things, um, as far as the providers, a lot of the, the, um, providers that are working with them, they keep masks pretty much most of the day. And most of them, because they're kind of active and out and about, they wear the face shields because it's just, it's hard to keep a mask. And, right. And, in that so most of the providers and the teachers that the, the early preschool teachers are wearing face shields that's seems to be what what's kind of out and about and I would share as a parent and kind of watching um, and is there you know and, and we're realizing though we're we're taking uh, an increased amount of risk I mean the reality is it's yeah. it's just more of a risk we've opened our bubble and they're gonna be around other kids um, some of the latest research coming out from is for some reason the transmission amongst children seems like it's less prevalent than amongst adults. But it's it's early research, and I think as everybody said, 
you know, we, we read an article today and then it, the information exactly. is tomorrow. But that's that's kind of what's happening on the ground. I've just shared since I just I just dropped her off at camp about an hour ago. So I was live and in person dealing with this. So I you know, I'm seeing what people are doing out, out there. And they're they're a good camp and I think they have really good protocol and you know, and they're doing the best. I mean, all the counselors are all masked up and regularly sanitizing and doing that. But the reality is it's, you know, the kids, they're, they're not gonna keep masks on throughout the day. And Tom, you're right. It's the responsibility of the adults to try the best they can. We cannot prevent it all. Um, we can't, it's, you know, but we can try our best. Um, the other thing is the adaptive buttons have worked well for some of my people, adults with autism, because they really don't want things touching their head. They don't want it to suffocate them. So I've recommended the plastic shields for them. And then In there was another question. So then the, the follow up to that was, because um, I, I know this too, is that some masks actually frighten kids and frighten people with disabilities. Is there a, but it sounds to me like maybe the open, not when I say open, I mean like the clear, the face shields, sounds because like maybe is, that's yeah. a way to go for the therapist. Maybe that's a way to go. What do you think? You and Tom, I guess, should take that. I, I think it depends on the individual. You're going to have to evaluate that. That's going to be trial and error. It really is. This is really, sorry, just to jump in really quickly. This is coming from early start therapists who are wanting to make sure that the toddlers can see their mouths when they're working with them. So obviously the face shield um, being the yeah. clear one seems like the best option, but then there was also a follow-up. Someone said, my understanding is that the face shield without mask is not as effective. Well, you know what? Clinically, if you're trying to teach a child how to form their mouth, or articulate and, and use their tongue in the correct way, you're gonna have a really hard time with a face mask on. You are. So if they need to model a behavior, I think the face shield is the way to go. It's up to, and Tom, could, Tom can jump in. There, there's what? also, oh, I was just gonna say, there, there are also masks that have been designed for people who are deaf that need to read lips that mm -hmm. have clear place in the mask. I mean, that's another option. We can, I, I can't remember where to get them, but I can find out from my counterparts that brought it up. So I just wanted to throw that out. If they can tolerate a mask and it, you, but they do make them for people that do lip reading. So it would be sort of successful, but still, I agree with you, Petite, the face shield's the safest. And the problem with those uh, masks, they still pull, so the lips are restricted. You're not getting the full movement of lips. So, you know, it's trial and error. You just do the very best you can. There are a couple more uh, questions directed at you, Petite. And one of them was if you're currently providing in-person services. No. I guess at this point in time. We're not currently. No, we're not. OK. And then another one was, sorry, give me one second. Will you be staggering your service your services day to allow your day services to allow for a smaller number of participants to attend? Oh, definitely. I, I think it's five people per nine hundred square feet, and that includes staffing. People are forgetting that includes staffing, guys. So I'm lucky I have a large building, but I will be limiting the number of people on phase one. Well. Phase one to me is prevention mm -hmm. and preparation. My phase two, when I allow them back in, um, it'll be very small and it'll stay small until I feel reasonably assured that there are no more tweakings I need to make. We're gonna be assessing every single day. Okay, this isn't working or we need more precautionary measures or we need to change this. So that, first ring entry group is going to be small so I can and the staff can reassess every single day and and the truth is I have a lot of older adults they're 18 to, my oldest is 73 I have a lot of comorbidity issues in other words they have 
uh, medical, underlying medical issues that prevent them from being the first group to come in. They'll probably be the last group. Also, there's family members that are very, very concerned about giving permission for their individuals to come in. I've got to respect that. And there are, are participants that don't want to come in. They're afraid. Right. I will continue to run my Zoom, my 20 Zoom classes a week while I'm do, when I get to in-person service. And then, um, will LA Gold be following the industry guidelines for high-risk limited personal services businesses described in Phase Three of the State Cal OSHA and DPH reentry plan? I hope that I, I like I said, I did Phase One and Phase Two. I hope that everything I'm doing is lining up with um, everything that's been published. I'm hoping, but like I said, I'm developing it. Once it's complete, then I'll do the comparative. I got to a point where I had six different resources I was looking at and I got overwhelmed and I said, I'm gonna do it this way and then I'll take plan by plan and do a comparative to assure I've addressed everything. So I hope that answers the question. I will be comparing my finalized plan, well, my rough dra draft plan to um, Cal OSHA. And then a couple of people just followed up on the masks you were talking about, Mary Lou. Someone said you can find them on Etsy for $25. And another person said they're called uh, Rafi Nova masks. Yeah. So just wanted to mention those. Um, someone asked if you are open to sharing your plan with other providers, Petit. I don't want the liability because if I omit something and somebody gets sick, I would, not only would I feel bad, I'd be devastated, but um, that's a hard one because I want to be helpful to everyone. I'll talk to my attorneys on my board and um, we'll come up with wording, we'll come up with wording that would say, this is, you know, whatever. You, you have to develop your own plan and take your own risks. I have to check with my attorneys on the board. Unfortunately, California is a litigious state and I don't wanna, nor do I personally wanna be responsible for omitting something that creates a problem for another agency. And then there's just a couple people thanking you for sharing all the details that you shared. So thank you, Petit. You're welcome. But if people want a copy of my Reentry form, I will gladly send that to Rihanna. And if you want it, or Mary Lou, you direct me who. And you can use that as a mock up for your reentry check in. Um, that, I, that I have no liability on because it's a very simple form and you, you can make it adaptable to what you need it for if people want that. If they don't want it, then I won't send it. But let me know, Rihanna, if people want that form. I'd imagine they do. Um, you're, you're welcome to send it to me because I have everybody's email that's participating today, so. Okay. I'll get that out to them. And then, did you guys wanna go ahead and take additional questions at this time or is there anyone else that was, okay. So, let's see, I'm trying to do this in order. Um, how will the community-based day program provide safety? So it's pretty general. Um, well, I think you need to refer back to the CDC, the California Public Health Department, to the LA County Health Department, to your local cities. I mean, I know Culver City, when they started doing even curbside pickup, pick up, put out, what was it, a four-page list of questions yeah. to address? So um, we, you know, we need you guys to do that research because you know your ind the individuals that participate in your program and you also know your space and, and what you're gonna use it in. Um, 
but you really, uh, the things that Petit talked about, you have to be mindful of those in order to mitigate risk. I really think if everybody could look at in-person services on how do I mitigate the risk of the service, then you will be as safe as any of us are safe at this point in time. I mean, we all have to go to the market. It's like, I feel like I, you know, have, it's like, I have a short panic attack as I walk in there with my gloves and mask on and I mm -hmm. rush yeah. But um, the thing is, is that, you know, we're not pushing in-person services. I really want you to understand that. We were getting a lot of requests for it. So in order to do the best, be the best support to you guys, we're trying to, you know, say to you, if this is the direction you're going in, these are the things you have to think about and, and put, put together. I, I sent out the uh, individual, oh, now I can't remember the name of it, individual design plan. Whatever. It, was a, it, it was intended to make you think about certain things that you need to talk to the individual about, um, talk to your staff about, talk to the family about. Persons going back to in-person services isn't just, okay, calm down. It really has to be a group effort because you have to know that the individual where they live, everybody's being safe. I mean, that's yeah. a huge, and you also have to think about, is this, you know, does this individual understand social distancing? Can they tolerate a mask? Do they need it? Mm -hmm. It's just right. level. So I think that that's what we're trying to do today. And that's what, you know, sent out the information, what we were trying to do. We are, you know, as I said, a letter just came out from ARCA today in support of, hey, let's slow down and figure this yeah. out. I'm Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really. I'm simplifying it. But, um, you know, requesting DDS, let's, let's really look at this because, you know, the guidance you want, Petit, you're going to have that the second I get it, okay? I don't have it. <laughs> yeah, so, that's the joke. It's that, like, how do you do something? That's why I have all these CDC um uh public health recommendations um who re you know who recommend that i had all these plans out and i was like oh my god i'm getting i'm getting freaked out so hopefully well, they've done some research and it'll be narrowed down well i think that the pro they are i mean they have a whole covid team i mean I, I i don't want you guys to think they're up there going oh well we don't know i mean nobody knows what to do it's we yeah. don't Oh, and so it's one of the most frustrating experiences aside from people getting sick and, and people dying it's like we can't tell you i wish i had a magic button but we don't and so i think dds is trying to be very mindful of the ever-changing you know situation and i think when things started looking better everyone went all right we're out of, you know we're out of this we're gonna make it through oh. and now it's a mess so we just want you to be mindful. We want to give you any information we have. I bet it's as good as the day we give it to you. Um, they just came out with a big thing about 10 hand sanitizers that used um, wood-based uh, wood, wood alcohol. Alcohol, and it's not effective. Again, it's lethal. So we do have up on our website those brands to watch out for. So there's, you know, who knew? I didn't know that three days ago. So it's it's ever changing, and we want to support. We want our individuals. I know people are getting you know very depressed and and very anxious because we don't know what's going on, and they don't see their friends, and they don't see the staff they know. And you know we totally appreciate that, but at the same time, we have to be. You know we have to understand the risks, and I think it's more. It's not even about re-entry or, or re-emerging. I know some of the services have not stopped and we're not saying stop. We're just saying we want, you, you know, as you, I forget how they want support living agency, when well, they're re-emerging, <laughs> you know, they've been providing support of living all this time, but we just need to, you know, I just need everybody to, to really think about this. And I think Tom has something. Well, I, I just wanted to chime in after. Um, I wanted to also reflect to the group kind of what's happening with the statewide conversation right now. And as Mary Lou alluded to, um, it's, it's ongoing. 
Um, before I begin, though, I really want, and I, I, we had a board meeting last night, and I said it, I don't know everybody that was there, but I really want to thank all the providers for your patience, your fortitude, your creativity, your flexibility. Um, we're in uncharted waters, and I think we're all trying to reinvent the wheel together here. And it's not difficult, and we're facing a, a really unique balancing act between economic survival and public health risk. And the reality is no matter what we do, um, we can do everything in the world, there's still gonna be a risk. And that's the reality. Um, and it's a really unfortunate reality that we're facing. And so the directors group has, I mean, there's, there's frustration, but we also understand the bind that DS is in with the state is that, you know, Nancy is giving us sort of like, we're getting 30 day directives. And that's because they're in response to, um, a, a, you know, an emergency. So you can only do like 30 day, 30 day drafts of a directive because that's how it's, um, but we're kind of saying, yeah, but it's not helpful trying to navigate this crisis or trying to run a business month to month. Like we need longer term, we need some sort of kind of longer term. And Nancy's saying, yeah, but this is the way that it's written for a state yeah. of emergency. Um, so this morning, and I thought it was a really good letter, and uh, we shared it with Joan, shared, Joan will share it with the group, from um, provider, from like a disability alliance, and from um, ARCA to, to the DDS, saying, we, we understand, basically we understand the difficulty, um, but we don't want to incentivize companies to feel like they have to go, what Mary Lou was saying, to go back into in-person service delivery. Right. And what we need is, you know, sort of an ongoing understanding, like to how long might we be able to, to do retention funding? How long can that possibly extend? It looks like there will be extensions coming out, but there's nothing that we've formally seen. Um, that's the hope. And also, looking at virtual service delivery models like how how would that look going forward long term like will the department support um if we can if we can um provide documentation if we can provide um some sort of concrete understanding about how that virtual service delivery is happening um will there will we be able to reimburse for service delivery um those are the questions to the department and i thought um, and you'll take a look at the letter, which is saying it much more succinctly than I am. Um, I think that she really echoed the collective voice of the directors group um, to DDS is that we really need some more specific guidelines because we've been going month to month, really trying to understand what we're working with. And now we realize this is not just going to be a 30 day event. This is not like a, a, a fire. This is not like, you know, a, a brief acute this is gonna be a long-standing um, emergency. Yep. And we're gonna need longer term guidance. So push has got to come to shove where we need to be able to get you folks guidelines. But what um, I wanna know, and I, I, I think it's a collective voice, all the directors are saying, we don't want people to feel like they have to go back into in-person service yep. delivery Thank you. Sooner, than, sooner than necessary. That um, we have been, I, I really have to thank this provider group again, because I've seen some of, what you guys have done, um, being able to do virtual services and keep people connected using, you know, this platform and using Zoom um, and using FaceTime and, and phone and everything else. So there is a certain amount of creativity that we can and we're continuing to develop. Um, it's not the same. And there are going to be families and, that are going to want more in-person connection. And we recognize that. So, um, but it's kind of like what I'm faced with um, at Westside Regional Center with my staff is what am I going to do because we still have to pay the bills. We still have to do, there's a lot that we can do virtually, but we can't do 100% virtually. Right. Um, so it's, it's like a balancing act is, so I have staff come into the building. I have people that do need to come in. And like what Petit has been saying is trying to do as much as I can with safety protocols to make it as safe as I can to limit the foot traffic, to limit the amount of interaction, but also acknowledging and having a recognition that we're not gonna be able to do this 100%. I mean, there is a safety risk out there and it's just, it's, it's real and it's um, unavoidable. So I just wanted to echo that. I really wanted to thank this group again. Um, 
I am hoping either this afternoon or tomorrow there will probably be another meeting with the with DDS with the directors. Um, so hopefully more information will be forthcoming. And they had they had hinted that they were going to give us new directives this week. I haven't seen them yet, obviously, or I would be sharing them. Um, but something should be forthcoming to give us an idea. I'm anticipating that there's going to be extensions because there's been such an uptick and spike in cases in California. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to wait, Tom, I need to jump in real quick because we have yeah. a ton of questions and I'm yeah, trying to answer them. Um, but there is some that's directed at WRC. And I mean, I could answer quite a few, hopefully like in one shot. The reason for this call again, is that everybody needs to prepare their re-emerging slash re-entry plans. That's why we had Petite come on because she really, really looked at everything. So, and so she has her plan in place. One of the questions is, is there a drop dead date? And I'm paraphrasing, when we should reopen. Again, it's dependent on you, the community you serve, your staff, but you need to have the plan in place. The second thing is, which is what Mary Lou can answer, does the plan need to be approved prior to doing the, the soft reopening? That's a question for Mary Lou. We are not approving plans. No. Viewing plans, there's no approval. Um, we are asking that you provide this, that to us so that our service coordinators will know what families should expect. Um, but we're not approving anything. We, we can't. Just like Petit said, I can't hand you this because I don't know if it'll work for you. We would like to see um, any plans that you've developed to, and we will ask you, gee, did you think about this? Did you think about that? You may have missed some steps. But we're not approving them but we would like to review them so that we know how you're going to be operating as always you always give us your program designs and your schedules so to answer the question no we're not <laughs> so mary let's just to go off of that i just want to make sure this gets addressed because it's been here for a while um there are people who have been providing services in person this whole time and they want to know you know, do you want to see a plan for them, a formal plan, even if you're not approving them, do you want them to submit something regardless, even if they've been still operating? I think it would be great to have it as part of your program design because actually it should be. Um, the reason I say that is because we know what you're doing. We can provide that information to service coordinators who have potential referrals that, you know, this is how they're this is their COVID plan or whatever we want to call it, you know, their in-person plan. Um, do we absolutely have to have it? No, I mean, but we really, it would be beneficial to both sides because we would be educated as well as if we did see something that, oh gee, did you think about? We can at least say, did you read this guide from the CDC? You know, you can address that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's a challenging world. I, I tell you, we are not the health experts. Tom looks like yeah. the to answer. You know, I, I also wanted to address, because it brings up a question that I was asked by, um, about like liability waivers and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want people to do liability waivers per se, um, because it puts people, you know, it's, there's, you know, for the Lanterman Act, um, I know Lanterman sent something out is that it, it we're not supposed we're supposed to be free service so we're kind of putting a potential economic hardship on a family if they have to look at litigation what i think that people should do and we've kind of talked to our lawyers on this because it's like what is our liability and there hasn't been any cases where people have been held accountable and i our legal opinion is that it's going to be very difficult to say that anybody's liable um on because it's, it's just such an unknown at every level, at local level, state level, and federal level, that's gonna be very difficult to prove neglect <laughs> and negligence. Um, but what would be, what was advised is that you basically, you outline a protocol and then you have a family meeting um, and you say, this is the safety protocol. This is what we're doing. This is you know how we're trying to protect you. Um, but also, having the person either it's the the 
individual, um, or if they don't entirely understand it, their conservator, their family member, acknowledging that this is this we met and this is you outlined what the safety protocol was, and then you also acknowledge there is a risk. I mean, this is you you are, there is a certain amount of risk that in in going out and in, in being with others, being with providers, there is a certain amount of risk. So that um, would probably you know, and it's it, it, that's sort of the best protection I think that you can ask for is that you're saying we do have a protocol, but there is a risk. So. Um, I just wanted to answer that question because it, it had come to me before from another provider. Um, Tom, my my attorneys on my board uh, agreed there should be no liability. We all agreed on that, um, but liability statement, release the liability. But what we did create is an acknowledgement of COVID-19 protective measures in the workplace attached to that. And as you said, if the individual can't understand it, their conservator would have to sign for it. And we'll do ongoing training regarding it once we open up. And we are doing training remotely anyway. But attached to that will be um, what are the symptoms of COVID? What's the history? What, um, what WHO and CDC and State Department's overview is of COVID? That will be attached to every form that gets signed um, and acknowledge that they received that and read it. That's the best my attorneys could come up with. Um, and they will also receive the individual COVID-19 response plan. So that'll be a best we could do. And Rhiannon informs me we have 41 more questions. So I guess we better, we better jump on. No, we don't because I've been answering them. So, um, uh, Rhiannon, there's a couple that I didn't get to. They're towards the bottom. Okay, they're and still again, showing I'm all unanswered on my end, but I'll, I'm not. Oh. If you want to read the ones you haven't answered, you can go for it. Okay, so just to clarify, because there's quite a few that keep on popping up, the essence of this call is that everybody needs to have the plan in place. You need to talk to the community you serve. Your staff has to be on board. WRC will not be approving the plans. However, that may change. So get those done. Um, another question was, will there be the extended absentee payments in vaccine? Do not guarantee that. I mean, you can't think that way. You've got, again, this is, we're in uncharted territory, but I don't think that the state or the feds are going to keep on with this absentee um, payment no. plan until there's a vaccine. So right. it, it's, that's, you need to start, everybody needs to get their head focused in on how you can do this safely. So... And again, there's always going to be those unknowns. Um, and then a, a third question was about the clear face shields and whether or not the um, families should be buying them for the people that are entering their homes. There are a ton of, and if whoever adds the asset, send me an email because uh, Chris Arroyo is getting in another shipment. And he just, just send me an email and I will send that out. I will send it out what Chris sent last night because it is coming in, but everybody needs to fill out his little form. And so he has, he has some. So the, the answer is, is that you can't expect the family to be paying for the face shields that you need to be wearing. So, uh, so Riyadh, and if I've hit, if I, I, cause I know I kind of grouped a whole bunch of questions in all together. Oh, and then somebody, quite a few questions have asked about Petite and, and if she could send out what she did. The issue is, is that all of us are individual. Yeah. She drilled yeah. down, she thought of everything. But if you have questions, this is being recorded. You can go back and listen to her opening. Um, she is going to share with us her checklist when people are entering the program and that kind of stuff. It's 10 questions, as she said, um, and we could tailor it to how we, I, I mean, we, I know that we have one that we're checking off, 
Um, but if she's willing to send that to Rhiannon and Rhiannon will send it to everybody that's on the call. Um, but again, she's not going to send her reentry plan because it's different for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through as many questions as we can, and we'll try to do brief answers. <laughs> How's that sound? Sure. Um, so these are the ones that I show aren't answered. So Joan, I don't know if you got them or not, but can someone confirm if the order that is set to expire allowing us to do telehealth will be extended? I still haven't heard if we will be able to continue. Okay, that's one of the guidances that's mm -hmm. every 30 days. It is my opinion and my opinion only that we will probably continue to see telehealth for quite some time just because of the, of the virus. What is the plan for safety and sanitation as far as transportation services for the clients? No, no. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say. That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll be here. Oh. Transportation providers will have to provide their COVID plans and their risk plans um, just as every other provider is doing. Um, there are some interesting ideas out there. Um, we are, you know, we are asking them if they're going to continue to transport, how, how's it going to look? You guys have to realize that those 15 passenger vans may have six people on them. So it's, it's going to be, that one is probably going to take a little more time. So I can't answer that, but they're going to have to have a lot of precautions and a lot of disinfecting and transportation will be a struggle. I can guarantee that. Yeah. And it's so needed. It's one of the most needed services. And I, I would share things that I've seen, plans that I've seen other regional centers use. They have, who have done some in-person transportation. They have, like Mary Lou was saying, less capacity, more spread apart. They have, um, they've had like plastic barriers between, between seats. They keep the windows open. They frequently sanitize. That's just, kind of general thinking and brainstorming that I've heard from other transportation providers that have done it, things like that is what it's been looking like. And I know Lyft has a bunch of procedures and that they, they have specific guidelines for transporting people. So stuff's out there. I mean, I would, I'd be looking at what other providers are doing and what Lyft and Ride and those are doing. Yes. And there are um, hats that have masks, uh, excuse me, shields attached to them. And I think that um, one of the things that transportation is looking at I mean, they're in the process, but you know, it's, it's in confined space. So we have to, I mean, people are putting shower curtains down the middle because plastic is kind of dangerous if there's an accident or somebody bumps mm -hmm. their head. So they're still working out a lot of the details. I was planning on requesting all staff to test prior to reopen. How much notification prior to reopen? What? Cool. Well, testing, as we said, yeah. testing is as good as the time you took the test. Um, right. in residential facilities, um, they have been tested because the health department told them they needed to get tested. Um, that's going to be part of your risk management plan. I, I can't tell you how long um, you can get tested and it's negative and you get tested again and it's yeah. positive. Yeah, and so I, I, we don't know, um, but if that's going to be part of your reentry plan, you should put that. Um, I don't quite get this one. Um, in community-based programs, how many clients will be allowed on the buses? Where will they use the bathrooms? Will they still be delivering meals on wheel? There's a lot of questions here. Um, what other community activities will they participate in? I'm gonna refer you back once again. You have to look at your program and you have to look at the risks. You have to look at what the community, um, where you're going to be, what their guidelines are. You, you know, like right now restaurants are shut down again, you know? And so, or bars are, I don't know. I can't, I don't even know what, what's shut yeah, down. Yeah, but it's the bars, but restaurants, it depends. I mean, it totally depends. I, I have a, I have a question and maybe um, Petit, you can answer this. It's one about, I, I haven't heard of this, the fogging of a room. So 
I'm mm. not entirely sure what that means. Uh, are they me, meaning? Are they meaning where you set off like a bomb? It's like a bug bomb, but I've heard that they have disinfection bombs. Is that yes. what they're talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't know how effective it is. I haven't used it. Um, I don't know. I don't think they, they're definitely not using that in hospitals um, no. around here. So, and, and there's risk to setting off those bombs, you know. You have to do it in a cer certain amount of square feet. You could blow your windows out of your building. So I don't, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. I would check, I would check, uh, I'd look online and see what the um, guidelines are on that. And I don't know, again, I would look that up on the EPA website for approved product. I yeah. wouldn't spend my money on it unless I knew it was approved. Yeah, and, it, and it's also, if you think about it this way, disinfecting, wiping down with disinfectants, to me, because I'm a bleach queen, is far more effective than anything that you set off and walk away from. So I, I, would, I would save my money and do the old fashioned route. And I would also recommend again, get rid of your upholstered stuff. If you're gonna use upholstered stuff because you need special adaptive equipment or anything like that, I would recommend trying to get a wipeable surface on top of it, like if it's um, even in a van, I would get wipeable car car seat covers, um, or things that could be laundered. But um, you can't really disinfect upholstery unless you do a deep clean. Okay. Um, there's just a, a lot of questions about whether or not telehealth can continue. So I'm gonna move past those because you pretty much answered those. Let's see. For early start therapists who will work in dual counties, Ventura and LA, will we be able to service both counties in person with DDS directives? I, I, there are different um, guidelines in Ventura County and in LA County. So if you're in LA County, you're going to follow LA County's guidelines. Um, you're in Ventura, you're going to follow Ventura. I just want to emphasize if you're traveling with a service that you have enough PPE that you can change in between appointments. So if you're, let's say, a speech therapist, you need to have, you know, masks that you can dispose of. I would have some kind of plastic gown or washable gowns like Petit said, probably in the long run, those are less expensive. But every time you travel from house to house, you have the potential to spread or be infected. So I would make sure that you have a lot of PPE and a lot of sanitizer. Because I know if you're traveling, you know, you're going from appointment to appointment, you may not have the opportunity to wash your hands. Soap and water is the best thing in the world, but if you can't get to it, hand sanitizer is not. Um, can Petite make any recommendations for in-home service providers? I'm an early start in-home service provider going into family homes. What, what kind of recommendation? regarding preventing their own illness? Doesn't specify. Well, I'm assuming it's to prevent their own illness. Mary Lou was just very, very clear um, about the necessity to um, gown down, the necessity to change her PPE. I would not reuse that mask that I went in there with. What about changing clothes? Um, if you have a gown on, that protects what you're sitting. Remember, your butt's sitting or you're gonna kneel on the floor with a child. I would make sure that um, I would have uh, pants that I could take off, not totally naked, but like pants that I could put on if I know I'm gonna play with a child on the floor. And when I get out of that house, take those pants off so my pants that I wore in the morning are not infected or, or, or are, um, don't have to be disinfected. What Mary Lou said was actually perfect. And, and an idea, it, yeah. Get maybe idea, use PPE. Yeah, if, if you are gonna be down on the floor playing with kids, 
wear some sweatpants over your work clothes and you know explain to the family it's for your precaution as well as mine as soon as you walk I walk out the door and you take the sweatpants off you still have your jeans or slacks or whatever is underneath you want to think that you just don't want to carry anything in or out with you you know and and just have a big bag where you can put everything and throw out the washer when you get home that the, the, the other thing is if you're bringing in things to play with to stimulate the children i bag them up or i would tell the parents they're responsible for their own things uh, i wouldn't be bringing things in that would be reused by any other child. I would also buy myself a bunch of chuck, chucks, the disposable chucks, and I would use those chucks to lay out any, anything that is gonna be mine um, that I'm taking out of there. I would lay those, uh, the chuck on the floor or on the table so you create a sterile field and you have those things there. When the session is over, I would roll up those items in the chuck and throw it in a disposable bag and deal with it when I got home. And remember, you're gonna be driving around. It gets hot in the car. Heat's one of the best ways to kill things. I'm not saying it's gonna kill COVID, because it hasn't, but it'll be enclosed. And you can deal with that and disinfect with that when you get home. I wouldn't try to um, make yourself crazy in between appointments. It'll take you an hour to do everything. But sweatpants is a great idea. Or surgeon pants. You know, I used to use the surgeon pants when I did visiting nurse service in New York um, when there were big epidemics of things. And I put the surgical pants on. You can wash them. And I bought booties. I would wear booties on my shoes. I think just kind of along these lines, you guys have pretty much addressed everything in this question, but regarding in-home supports, uh, people are wondering, while well, therapists wear face shields, do we expect the family members to wear masks? Yeah. I, I think that if you're gonna provide in-home services <clears throat> and you want the families to wear masks, I think you should have that discussion before you go there and say, hey, in order for me to do this, I need anyone that's going to be involved, parents, whoever, to have a face. I agree. Yeah, really. Is there a recommendation or guideline by the state or Cal OSHA for staff participants per square foot indoors? I think it's five. Uh, I think it's five people per 900 square feet. Um, I could double check that. I'm going to go double check it but it's five people per 900 square feet. So when basically in a nine by 10 room, there would be five people, but I'm gonna double check that stat. I've got it written down. I'll be back later. Um, if we haven't answered your questions by the time this is up, please send them to me. I think we're kind of ticking them off though, aren't we, Rhiannon? Yeah, for the most part. Um, I know one that hasn't been answered, although I personally know the answer, but there's a re residential provider that wants to know if they're not officially a day program, can they continue to provide day program services to clients they are currently serving for residential services? What? Yeah. yeah. I, you're talking about, I, I think that is an in-home day program um, service uh, to be a uh, service provider for in-home day program that would really be something that we would have to do on an individual basis um, we have a lot of programs that are doing uh, virtual day services and we really want to strongly encourage um, providers mm -hmm. the residents of people and I'm sure they're missing them and they're they have the opportunity for the virtual program I think that that we would encourage that and um, we're not um, at this point, doing in-home day programs. Not right now, but the case-by-case -case basis, you can certainly contact your quality assurance person to discuss it. Kind of on that note, people of several people have asked who to send their plans to. Um, typically, it would be to the QA specialist for. Um, adult services like work, day services, tailored services, et 
cetera, that would be Jill and Liddy, uh, Lindenera Amador. Um, for residential, it would be Joe Montez or Monica. Um, for sport living, if there's anything you want to put in there, or ILS, that would be Jesus. Uh, family home agencies right now would be Claudia Williams. Uh, infant and children's would be Sonia Seriano. Um, and if all else fails, you can send them to me. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> Um, I, someone said, I'm confused. I started a re-entry safety protocol and I was told to hold off until WRC provides more guidelines. Now it is being indicated that there will not be one. I was also told that parents will sign a letter prior to re-entry and this sample would also be provided. I honestly feel information is unclear. Well, and I'm there with you. Um, things are changing. Um, what we want everybody to do, and I think we've been consistent in all of our, our SPAC meetings and our, and our vendor meetings, we really want you to always be thinking about a plan to do in-person services. Um, I think that at this point, going ahead and submitting those or, or at least starting them because we don't know what we don't know, unfortunately. And it's really looking at, I can't emphasize looking at the risks mitigating the risks and saying this is what we can provide um, and this is how we're going to the best effort we're going to make to protect people our staff and the individuals that attend um, we have been hoping for guidance um, from the state it has not come yet it's still in process and as i said it's become confusing because when we started seeing the downside you know we saw, saw cases going down it looked like, okay, you know, maybe things are getting better, but th this increase over the last week and a half is worse than in the beginning of when California got hit. So we're not stopping. If people really wanna do, really feel comfortable doing in-person services and have, you know, really thought out a good plan and have talked to the individuals they support, then we, you know, we'll work with that. But, I, and I know it's confusing, but, it's challenging to be able to give you, this is what's happening right now, because I could tell you one thing today, and then when Tom has his meeting with EDS today or tomorrow, it could all change. So I just, I think the best information I can give you is to develop your individual response plans, your agency plans, your staff plans, how you're gonna, you know, what kind of PPE you're gonna use, everything addressing the CDC guidelines, CDPH guidelines and LA County Department of Public Health guidelines and look at your city guidelines because they have some stuff going on there too. It's yeah, so we're all looking at public health to tell us what to do basically. I, I guess it's the best way to sum it up. And so I don't know if I answered your question or confused you more, but that's where we are right now. So I hope that helps. Okay. There's just a lot of, I, I think there's still confusion about if it's approved, sp specifically around um, telehealth versus in person, just if they're given the approval by WRC or by the state to go about providing those in-person services, do they need to, if they don't yet feel comfortable, can they continue telehealth? Okay, we're not approving one way or the other. Telehealth is an option and we are supportive of telehealth. If in-person works better and you have really done a great risk assessment plan and have good protocols in place, then I, and you're comfortable with doing it, that's fine. We're not saying no to any of it, but at the same time, we, what our biggest concern is, is the family prepared for this? Is the individual prepared? And are you prepared to make sure you can mitigate any risks that are possible? I don't, I don't anticipate telehealth going away. You have to realize in more rural regional centers, they've been doing telehealth for years because they don't have providers. I mean, we're really lucky in LA, we have providers that can actually go and physically work with a person. So I'm, I'm, 
I, I side on that we're going to continue telehealth for into the future. I don't know when or if it will ever not be a survey. Okay. And then um, someone wanted to know if there's a hold on new participant entries into day services right now. Well, I think that there's, um, I don't, I don't want to call it a hold, but I think that people are trying to be very mindful of what the individual needs. Um, if you're talking about virtual services, I think that's an assessment that the provider and the service coordinator and the family needs to make. Um, if it's in-person services, I think that it would be very wise to have your, your plan, your um, COVID plan, for lack of a better word, in place so that you can have that to explain to a new participant or to a family that's helping that participant. Um, and that's the, you know, I, individual, there are individuals that want to do certain things and we just want to make sure it's as safe as possible for them. So I, I don't, I wouldn't say there's a hold, but if you don't, if right now you don't have a virtual program in place, it would be hard for us to say, yeah, you can go to day service, but there's no plan, you know? So I think you've got to give us all your information so that we can then let the service coordinator know this is what you have. Oh, you're on mute, Petite. Petite, you're on mute. Oh my God, I hate this stuff. Okay. Um, did you mute me, Mary Lou? No. Um, okay. It might have been me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rhiannon. Um, anyway, the 900 square foot room, it cannot be filled. The rule is it cannot be filled with furniture. So you can allow 10 people in that room if it only includes the furniture you're using for them to sit at, like tables and chairs. If that entire perimeter of that 900 square foot room has bookcases and audio equipment and all this stuff, you've used up part of your 900 square feet. It will not allow you to create six foot distancing for 10 people. So basically the way I planned my agency, even though I had um, a 1200 square foot room, I walked off and used just the center of the room and one or two outlying areas for seating. And I set up my furniture accordingly in the center of the room. I don't know if that helps. All right. We, we hit most of them. They do keep coming, but... Um... Wait, there's one. Um, hold on. Uh, let me get it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Oh, will counselors be reaching out to participants regarding survey sent out about a week ago? What survey? Um, yeah. um, we gave you um, the per, uh, individual, oh, just blanking on the, the individual COVID response. Yes, COVID response. We ask that we get the service coordinators involved as much as possible. However, if they may or may not reach out to you, I think if a, if an, a participant has said, I want to go to ABC program, they're going to reach out to you. Um, when Because they, they're, you know, they're, in, they're calling their caseloads, you know, weekly. Sometimes it just depends on, you know, who needs what. So I wouldn't, if you have somebody that has expressed interest, I would get in touch with the service coordinator and go over your plans and COVID plan. Okay, I mean, there's, there's a couple of people who have had their hand up the entire time. Um, do yeah. you want to take a couple of those questions? We're at 11.56, okay. So. I'm gonna allow them to talk. So we'll start with you. Um, oh, your hand just went down. Okay. Christopher Travela, I don't know if you still wanted to speak, but I'm gonna unmute you. You're unmuted now. Christopher, can you hear us? Okay. 
He also asked some questions in the box, so maybe he's good with those. Let's see. And again, if your questions aren't answered, um, or if we're kind of glossing over and you want to drill down or drill down answer, just send it to us. Either just send it to me or to Rhiannon. Just respond to the town hall um, email that went out and we will get those answered. Okay, and then Carrie, I have unmuted you if you still have a question. I do. Um, so Cal OSHA has the uh, COVID guidelines by industry. And I'm just wondering what others are using for day services. COVID. Because of course there's not a specific one for the type of work that we do. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Um, like what Mary Lou is, has been said and Petita said is that we are literally using multiple guidelines. So even the Cal OSHA, so what CDC, and I understand your question, it's like, well, it's not, you know, day programs aren't in there, but if you call all of the information across the multiple agencies and you come up with a plan and you be, you think of things like what Petit thought of, you know, covering the, the signs so they can be wiped down. I mean, that's how serious Petit drilled down on it. So as long as you and your staff think of everything you could possibly think of, even the mundane, um, I think you're going to be okay. Um, also, I would look at senior centers. Anything senior centers have are very similar to day program. And when I checked with the city of Culver City, they said they saw our nonprofit day program um, would align with senior center programming. So I, I'm trying to use that That's too. And then how did, where, did Petit, where did you get the 900, the five people per 900 square feet? Is that, was that just an example of needing to use the 10 of no more than no, of 10? No, I got it. I thought it was from public health or it could be Cal OSHA or it's, mm -hmm. it's I, look it up. If you Google yeah. it, they'll bring it up for you. So it's 10 people in the, per 900 square feet of usable space. And if you divide it, it, it it's gonna come out to nine feet per person, right? Okay. So look, uh, you could Google that fact. I can't remember where I pulled it from. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm, I think maybe just one or two more at this point since we're getting kind of late here. So the person I unmuted has now typed their question and it was, my question was on visitation. How can we balance latest CCLD pin with ramp up of precautions and guidance from CDC, LAC, DPH, WHO, and Cal OSHA? Oh my God. Lee's favorite word right now. I think that you have to assess, and this is for residential facilities, um, Westside is recommending that if you're going to start visitations that they be done outside, um, that you have a, a very well thought plan, you look at each individual, how will they be able to social distance, will they wear a mask, is it good for maybe family to be in the car, individual in the front yard, they talk over the gate until you can see that the person comfortable, um, mm -hmm. maybe going into little yard visits. Um, you're really gonna have to look at your population. There are some people that who reside in residential facilities who can do social distancing and who can you know, understand what's going on. And then we have others that are gonna see mom and dad for the first time in over 100 days in person and they're not gonna be able to social distance. So you're gonna have to put all those I, we've been working on some plans for over a month regarding this situation, so this board really don't like right now, but it's really important. I know individuals are miserable without families, and I know families are miserable. So I think it's going to have to be really individualized. CCL came out and said that family members could come into the facilities. I found out yesterday. I, you know, I don't know if they were really looking at our population for that. Um, I think our provider 
been very clear to me that mm, we don't really want to ent have another entity come into the place where we've been trying to keep it as carefully monitored as possible. You guys have done a great job, and I know there's been a lot of pressure. And CCL has really given into the pressure of the families complaining, and it has it hasn't been a decision that's a safety decision, except they're saying it's for mental health and people are depressed and such. So I would recommend that you develop a plan and work with families and work with the individuals who serve to try and do outdoor type visits um, where you can have the six feet apart, where the individual understands that they're gonna sit at the picnic table on this side and mom and dad are gonna be on the other side, whatever it is. Um, I don't think there's a clear, one that you know one size fits all i think it's related to who the person is how much they can tolerate how much they understand and what space you have available for the visits but we're recommending doing them outside to us mm -hmm. okay i think we'll take this last one because they've had their hand up for a long time so i'm gonna unmute you lisa you're good to go hi can you hear me Yes. Okay. Um, my question is regarding early start. We were specifically told that we cannot provide early start uh, in person sessions, now, whether it be in home or in clinic, that we must remain on telehealth. Lanterman has told us differently. I'm wondering, you know, I have clients that are not doing telehealth because the kids are two years old and won't stay online and can't do it. So they've been without services for six weeks now and they wanna get back in the clinic. I've already submitted my plan a couple of weeks ago and was told it was too early because they were waiting for DDS directives. So what are we supposed to proceed now? Okay, well, uh, we kept told that we were gonna get those directives. We haven't gotten them. So yeah. what and one of the reasons we wanted to have this meeting was to clear up some of, I mean, I think staff were trying to really toe that line. We need, you know, we need support from the state. I think at this point, with your um, COVID plan, I think we're calling them that now, and if the family is comfortable, you have the PPE you need, um, uh, you can, you know, you can start doing those visits. I think some of the recommendations like Petit gave and we talked about, about having overclothing that you can, you know, take off if you've seen the child, having shields, having, you know, all those preparations. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that, you know, I think that we should just move forward with that if telehealth isn't an option. And I do understand with the toddler, I can't even imagine <laughs> them looking at the screen for five minutes. So, um, I, <laughs> no, no, it's not. And I think, um, I, it's like every time we thought things were going to get better, they got worse. And this last time it just got so bad. And I think that we just have to be as cautious as possible, but we also don't want, especially our early start kids, not to get the services that they need because I, I used to be an early mm -hmm. start. I know how vital it is. I've seen kids that we thought weren't, were going to stay with us that through early start really did well and, and managed to move on to regular education and live their lives. So I don't want that interfered with. So I, I will say to you today, um, and if you, I will try to put something together so that it can be sent out that, you know, what we talked about today about early start. I just want to make sure families, therapists really come together with a good risk plan and a good PPE plan and disinfectant plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm on mute. Just to clarify, anyone who's asking about the recording, this meeting was recorded and we will make it available to anyone that registered. So um, if you're on here now, or obviously if you registered, you'll receive an email with the recording and hopefully we'll be able to get it up on our website soon as well. So um, yeah, thank you so much. And Rhiannon, I'd like to thank you again for setting this up. You are like the the master of ceremonies with these Zoom meetings. So again, I really, truly appreciate you. And Mary Lou, thank you. And thank you, Petit. Thank you so much. And thanks, Tom. So again, if, if we didn't answer any of your questions, please just email them to us and, and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. 
I also would just like to say thank you to all the providers. I know this has been a horrific five months. Believe it or not, we're in month five. Um, who thought we would be here? And I think people mm -hmm. have things. You've been getting so many mixed messages as we have been getting mixed messages because they changed. And we're trying to keep up with what's happening. But um, if you have any, as, as Joni said, if you have any questions and concerns, let her know. You can shoot me an email. Um, but I do want to thank you all because I know that your dedication and your support your services really make a difference in the lives of so many people. So thank you. <coughs> all right, guys. See you all later. Thank you again. Everybody. <laughs>